Hey everybody, welcome to Oregon State University's Permaculture Design Course Pro. This is the summer fall offering of my group. And this is our office hour number one. So normally in office hours, what we'll do is we'll go through any of the questions that are in the question doc, uh, anything that's been in there previously, uh, I will go through. I love getting questions early. It gives me a chance to go through them and uh, do any sort of extra research I need but uh, any questions during is just fine. I'll go through any sort of announcements at the beginning of the conversation because sometimes we do have announcements and especially in this first conversation, there'll be a few number of them. I'm just gonna put in the question doc uh, link into the, um, into the chat. And uh, I do believe I deleted my piece there. I'll just get everyone to mute themselves. And we can ask questions either in the link or we can ask questions live. So either or works just fine for me. So I put the question doc in the chat. So if you want to put in questions, you can. Basically, I'll go through this whole process with you about how we do this. And any questions after that, we can, um, we can address as they come up. So first and foremost, I'm going to share my screen over to that document. There we go. Um, so this is our, our document. So this is the summer and fall, and that's the way you'll be able to identify that this is for us. It also has all the elements of the Zoom meeting. This is previous office hours, so if you click on that, you'll find all the previous office hours, including some from courses before. So if you're interested to go back and if any of these titles um, pique your interest, you're welcome to do so. Um, my mother is a very supportive mother, as many mothers are, and she actually goes through and um, time codes all these, which I would never have done. So this is my shout out to her. Um, uh, as, as a big thanks because I wouldn't do this, but she does and I just so love it um, because she watches them anyways, which is very sweet. So if you go into these, you'll find what to include in a base map. So those, these questions will always be populated if you do click on here. Uh, we had a question about volcanic ash once that we had to chat about. So you get that all in there. So if there's a desire, this is the uh, archive, if you will, of our hours. And sometimes there'll be student mentorship sessions. And I'm, I'm less on putting up the mentorship sessions than I am the office hours, but the mentorship sessions are great. Um, these are folks who have reached out and just need a little bit of extra help. And so I ended up just taking a bit of time with them, regardless of what it does. I'll just get everyone to mute yourself when you jump on. Um, when you're asking questions, uh, this is the format. So basically your name, where you are, and then link to your portfolio. The reason why the link to the portfolio is important is that you may be referencing something and you'll need to take me right there. And if you haven't already through the tutorials, you'll see that you can link directly to a slide just by clicking on the slide and then copying the above link after your permissions are uh, set to share. Um, and then going through and saying what your question is, you'll find that I talk a lot about bolded highlighting. And this is something I found over the last 13 years of working with clients is that when you're writing big blocks of text to clients, you really need to point out the highlights or else they kind of get bored. And if you make big monstrous um, designs like I do, uh, you know, they end up being these big binders and lots of material and lots of designs. and you need to high grade information to clients. So bolded highlighting is a great way to do that um, in your portfolio and I highly recommend it. Underneath this, we've got some resources from previous classes. This is a number of plant ID apps. This is a number of books that I've recommended every once in a while. And so we get into the habit of putting them up here. This is a brilliant book um, that I've made available because Katie Nelson made it available on small earth and dams. So if you'd like to take a copy of that, you're welcome. And then basically what you'll do is that uh, you'll go down to the, uh, the date and you'll just um, make a space or two because this is an editable document, which means we all have access to it. And you'll just put in your name and um, where you're from. And then basically what we've saw up here, you'll put that down there. And again, when questions come up, feel free to pop them in here. There's a lot of ways for you to ask questions. You can ask questions 
at the end of an assignment. We have a Q&A um, slide at the end of every assignment where you can ask specific questions to me that maybe you don't want the rest of the group to have access to. You can send me an email. Tech questions go directly to Canvas. So uh, something to, to think about there. But if you do have big questions or if you wanna go over design or design question, we can do that live on these office hours and we can have some live feedback. So um, I've got my iPad with me, which I use for design. And so if you send me information early, I can usually pull it up and we can do some sketching on there and start to talk about things like that. But that's generally uh, what we do during these office hours. So a um, couple of things, first and foremost, welcome. Welcome to the course, super exciting to have all you folks here. Um, PDCs, permaculture design courses are a great love and passion of mine. I think this is getting into 52 or 53 PDCs for me in my last 13 years of work and um, super fantastic to see so many people still interested in permaculture and still using these types of tools and processes. Something that's really interesting and different about this course in particular is that this is a course about progression, not about marks. And so if you are coming back to a university atmosphere for the first time after a long time of being away and um, in this in this world of education, sometimes we have past trauma that comes from higher education or even secondary or primary. Um, the marks are just there to guide you. I want you to get 100 marks. I'm not marking on a curve and I don't care about the marks. I'm sure somebody at the university will strike me dead by saying that, but those marks are just to help you get towards 100. So you'll find that the rubric lays things really well out. My tutorials really go into detail, but every once in a while, somebody doesn't watch something or does some, somebody doesn't do something. And so I say, you know, this is great. You've done a good job, but here, here, and here, this is a mark, this is a mark, this is a mark. You'll find then that your mark is three under, four under, and you can resubmit. It's really easy to resubmit. You basically, under your thread, uh, you'll get my feedback as you'll start to see. I do video feedback um, normally, and this allows me to give a lot more feedback in a short amount of time. It also allows me to draw on the screen, which is great. Wish I had this years ago. Um, but resubmission is fine. And so if you want to resubmit four or five times to get to the right mark, great. I very rarely have ever had anybody have to resubmit more than once because my my feedback is usually really specific and detailed, but um, it's it's really straightforward. Um, and yeah, don't don't be intimidated by the marks. They're just there to help guide you. And I want you to get a hundred percent. So if you do the work and have conversations or whatever, yeah, you'll find I'm I'm very flexible. Um, Dialogue is encouraged. So not only to me, but the rest of your classmates, you'll find that they'll comment and you'll comment on them. You've got about, I think it's two peer reviews per week. So you'll comment on two different uh, people's work. Um, and sometimes you can create great conversations. I've had people who are in similar locations create friendships that are still alive today, you know, six, seven years after the fact. So one of the nice things about permaculture and one of the reasons why I'm still involved with permaculture is that I meet some of the most remarkable people on the planet. They're usually um, great thinkers. They're usually systems thinkers. If they haven't done that before or know the name of it, they tend to have a high degree of uh, intelligence, both emotional and intellectual. And they tend to be people that are forward thinking. So I find a lot of the people that I'm around are former students or folks who came to permaculture and we became friends. So really do go back and forth. If I make comments, you're welcome to comment back. It's great to have that dialogue. This is a course on thinking, not on rendering. And this is really important to keep in mind. So people become obsessed with the rendering. This is not a course on rendering. I'm not teaching you rendering, even though the amount of tutorials I put together, you could argue that we are now. Uh, this course didn't have any of the templates or the tutorials uh, two and a half years ago. It was basically you figure yourselves out with your whatever you want to do to submit your assignments and we'll go from there. But a couple of years ago, I really wanted to create a professional level portfolio that folks could not only learn on, but then put out. And then as it got out there and I got feedback from uh, colleagues who'd been doing this, were, they were my mentors they started using the template. So you'll find that a lot of the instructors in the course have started to adopt the template um, and have started to use Google Slides, if, if, if not fully in part. Uh, I say all of this because people can become obsessed with learning the, the right way to render a design. And the right way to render a design is the least amount of time you take to put your ideas onto paper 
I've had students use crayon pencils. I've had students use crayons. I've had students use MS Paint. It really doesn't matter. If you're more comfortable drawing, if computers are not your forte or a lot of this is new to you and you're gonna be taking up some of that learning capacity within the course itself, just do paper and pencil, take photographs and just drop it into the template. It couldn't be simpler. So really don't obsess about learning a brand new program. And if Google Slides feels you know so far out there that you just don't feel like you can do it, but you know PowerPoint, even though for me, I feel like they're rarely similar, then you can download a copy of the template and you can open it in PowerPoint, just use it locally. Know that not all the formatting will transfer and you'll have a bit of work, but generally that works. Now you can work with Google Slides and the Google Suite offline through Chrome browser. Basically you have Chrome as a browser and you access your drive off of that and then you make it available offline. I've got a tutorial on it. But all of that long-winded conversation is just to say, don't become obsessed with the rendering. Just make it as simple as possible to get the information out. I, I have really close colleagues and friends who've been at this for 40 years and they still do stick line drawings. There's, they still do very simple drawings with stencil and it's just enough to get the idea across so the client can get into it. And as a good colleague and friend of mine, also an instructor in this course said, they'd rather the client spend money on the installation versus the rendering. Now, some folks and some clients will want a high degree render. And we'll talk about this more as we get into the course, but I will hire out somebody who is a landscape technician or a CAD technician or sometimes a 3D renderer to take my stick drawings and convert them into high resolution, high degree renders plus 3D renders. And that's fine. Sometimes that's what the, the design calls for, especially at uh, some of these upper echelons. I was just evaluating a 6,500 acre farm um, and I knew at some point they were going to want that level of conversation. So we talked about that, that got into the budget, et cetera. We can talk about budget later on the course, but really don't obsess about rendering. I'll say it once, I'll say it twice. Just do what comes naturally or do what is, is what you can do or follow the tutorials and you'll be able to use Google Slides just, just as is. Um, I just noticed that there was a little comment here. So I'm just going to check the chat. Uh, oh my, I suspect I'm not in the right office hour session. Please confirm. No, Victor, you're not, but you're welcome to stay if you like. Um, your office hours are the opposite weeks. So previous week and then next week. It's no worries. If you want to stay, that's fine. Um, and if you want to go, that's good as well. Good to see you. Uh, great. So I'm just going to go back here. And any questions that pop up, feel free to either raise your hand on Zoom or just put in the, uh, the chat there. Um, if your site is far away and you can only visit once or twice, you may wanna review the future assignments and collect your data all at once. So things like base map measurements, photographs, um, things like some of the client assay, like looking at trees and flagging. Flagging is when a tree over time will show and, and, and indicate the wind speed because of the amount of the top you know, foot to two feet is flagging in a certain direction. The soil, um, the soil assignment, some of the microclimate assignment, the plant survey, there's lots of assignments that require being on site. And so really consider where your site's going to be. If you're thinking, well, I own a piece of property, but it's in another country and I, I haven't been there recently, you may want to choose something closer just so that way you can get the full value out of this course. Because if it isn't um, if it isn't close, it'll be problematic. Um, have fun with the assignments. So uh, if you're reading ahead, you'll see that I've said this a few times. Uh, you learn best when you have fun. Uh, a couple of years ago, when I was starting out in my working, uh, my working career, I had an opportunity to uh, help with a new uh, snow sport called snow bike which was two articulating skis on a, a, a pseudo bike chassis going down the slopes. And I had a chance to work with one of the guys who created snow biking and he was there with Burton. Um, and he had this wonderful way of, of saying, you know, make people feel comfortable. If they feel comfortable, make them laugh. And if they laugh, they may just learn something. So I really do take an approach of just enjoying what I'm reading, enjoying what I'm looking at, poking fun at it and poking fun at myself. So that way I can really enjoy the process. And the more you enjoy this process, the more you play with sketching, the more you play with drawing, the better off you'll be. Um, while we have given you a completely uh, manipulation software, uh, Google Slides to design, I still firmly believe that 
uh, design is best by paper and pencil. Even if it's your first initial ideas, even if you print off an eight and a half by 11, you know, semi-transparent or low opacity render of your, your site as an aerial from Google Earth or Google Earth Pro, and then use transparency paper just to make circles and to understand different shapes and understand different pathways. There's something more visceral about the pencil and the arm and the moving and working with that than there is just taking a line and manipulating it on a computer or making a, a polygon. It's just, it's not the same. It's one of the reasons why I ended up investing in a iPad because I wanted to keep drawing. So really try and have as much fun as you can. Um, a lot of you, as you get to that first assignment, there's gonna be, what are your expectations of the course? And a lot of you are gonna say, I wanna be able to design a property and know how to design permaculture off of one course. I'll tell you now that's an unrealistic expectation. It took me between about three and five years to feel comfortable designing. It takes repetition, it takes attention to detail, it takes feedback. There's this idea that all we need is data or information. Well, data plus context equals knowledge. So if we have a, a, a datum point, if we have a thing that, uh, chickens have different levels of predatory awareness. So some chickens like black or Australorps are so aware of predation and the moment they get a hint that something's above them, they're beelining for the trees. And some chickens like Suffolk are in the clutches of the prey hawk by the time they realize that there's a problem. So you've got that data that chickens have predatory instinct and then you take it into context, oh, we've got different breeds and now we have a bit of knowledge. Once we add experience to knowledge, oh, we've had repetition with this, we work with different breeds, we started to actually raise chicken. Well, now we have wisdom that we can come back on and that whole process takes time. This course is mostly a, mostly a datum and forcing you or inviting you into understanding a bit more of your context. So really do structure your expectations appropriately that this course will give you a real good first run at a design and the amount you put in is the amount I can give you feedback on and the amount you take that feedback and revise or ask questions is how you will progress. Great ways to progress in this course, ask lots of questions, give feedback to my feedback, talk to others, look at other people's work. Great way to get zero value out of this course, do the bare minimum, skip through, get your certificate, but really you won't learn much. Um, Permaculture is a tool in your toolbox. It's not the entire box. Um, I'm a lowercase p permaculturalist. I, you know, it's a, it's a tool in my tool belt. And I worked in construction for many years. And I always likened it to, if I arrived at, at a site to build a house and I pulled out my screwdriver and the homeowner was like, oh my God, it's a screwdriverist. I should be worried about the level of interaction I might have with this client because they're going to think, I'm about this tool and I'm not. Permaculture is a, a beautiful tool. It's not the only tool. It's not the everything. You'll find some permaculturists say it's the wardrobe or it's the place to hang all of these other things. And I, I think that's a bit of hubris. I think that's a bit of, of humans trying to find the truth and find the truth and then hang everything underneath it. It is a wonderful framework. You can hang lots of things in it, but to give it its own due and truth and value is important as it is all the other tools and systems. You may find Korean natural farming or JDAM or biofertilizers or the Regrarians platform or key line design or natural sequence farming or Korean natural farming or biomimicry or Odom's laws. Like you may find all these little tools. I would just say, keep an open mind, keep an open toolbox, but not so open that you know your mind and your tools fall out. So really diversify that tool and mindset. Ask for help from me, from other students, know where to ask help. There is a general discussion within um, your course, which uh, Dow and Devin both monitor. So general questions, anything to do with tech, uh, accessing Canvas, you reach out to, to Canvas directly. Anything to do with design, anything to do with the template, anything to do with permacul permaculture at large, you can ask me directly. Um, have fun. So again, come back to having fun go down rabbit holes. If you find something you really enjoy, just enjoy it in, in as much as you can and share it with others. I'm just remembered something. I'm going to make a note here. Um, <clears throat> oh, interesting. So Karen, hold on two secs. Karen, the password is Javin. Make sure there's no extra spaces. Cool. 
Um, we're really working on your designer's mind. And, and a lot of people say this coming out of a PDC is that their, their mind and their eyes have opened up and they have their permaculture goggles on. And this is, this is very true when it comes to water. Um, I think it's one of the strengths of permaculture. Permaculture looks at water very uniquely out of the engineering sciences, out of agrology. And I think that's because there was a number of influences like P.A. Yeomans and others that brought this information into what, um, into what we were seeing. So you may find that your mind changes a little bit as you're going through the course. You may start to embody some of the principles or the ethics or the prime directive. And as I said to a colleague of mine the other day who was lamenting um, some of the geoengineering that's going on internationally, uh, it just seems like it washes out some of the earth repair that we do in this work. And maybe, maybe, maybe it does and maybe it doesn't, but I find it a much more courageous way to live to open my day with the thought of how can I take care of this earth, which is our primary asset, the people around me that manage that. And then finally, how can I limit my consumption so that way there's a little bit more surplus and give back to the people and the land I work on. That for me is what drew me into permaculture in a big way is that it seemed like a much bigger conversation that allowed me to operate, but it were guidelines. They weren't hard and fast rules. And this is why I've been in it for as long as I have. So, so much of your designer's mind is about, you know, thinking and, and chewing on the mental cud, so to speak. Uh, we really have to focus on changing the climate of the mind. And a lot of what, um, a lot of what we do is to help question some pre-existing conversations, programming, narratives, beliefs, and to potentially offer another way of looking at it. It's not to demonize those previous pieces because that takes a lot of time and energy is kind of a waste, but to offer potentially um, a, a different approach. Um, the burden is on the designers. So there's one thing out of almost everything else that permaculture is, um, I think, rightly criticized for, which is introducing um, non-natives into areas. And it takes the designer to take on the burden of implication. So if you implement a certain plant and you know it's advantageous, I don't use the word invasive, I don't use the word weeds, not knowingly, um, that plant may overtake a number of different plants or organisms that fill that niche within an environment because it has a, an advantage. Um, that's on us. So it, there's a high level of responsibility that comes with design work, especially when you're working in places you're not familiar with. And we need to take that on as a real, a real issue, a real, a real factor. Um, ask questions, as we've talked about. Uh, something that's really important, you can submit assignments late. Um, if they're after two weeks, you may not get the same level or, or feedback because I'm, I'm moving on and I'm working with the cohort as is. I do try to give everyone feedback, but just know that if it's, if it's beyond two weeks, it's going to be problematic. If you're getting to the end and you're just rushing through everything, that can also be problematic. So um, really do focus on, on having a, a good pace and a good step with yourself. I would recommend taking 20 to 25 minutes a day to work on the course and then leave a block of time between an hour and three hours every week to go deep into the course. You'll find that some of the assignments like the local plant survey um, and getting a sense of the climax ecology, if you're not familiar with these things, will take research and some time. Really do take on the break in September I would move ahead in the course. I wouldn't just take the break. I would, I would move ahead. Um, I forgot what the law is, but humans will fill up the luggage that they have to the space they, they have the ability to fill. And it's the same thing with time. Um, I work with clients all the time. And if they, they have a week to do something, they'll do it the day before it's due. So get ahead of it if you can. You'll be thanking yourselves. So all that to say, yes, I accept... Um, I accept uh, late assignments until the final due date. At the final due date, everything is due at 9 a.m. There is no extensions. If you can't finish by the end of the course, you have the ability to re-enroll for, for a small cost, um, or you can just finish the course without a certificate. You'll have access to the course as long as the internet is up and OSU is an institution, so that's not a problem. Um, but you'll have a chance to re-enroll. Okay, so it looks like Karen's having some problems. So I'm just going to quickly see if I can't uh, just send her a direct 
um, direct email. I'm just going to put this back here. I know she's already here, so I'm just going to remove this version thing. Maybe that'll help. Okay. So everyone always asks, and they usually ask in assignment three, four, or five. So I'm going to go through my design process, but I'm going to switch this on the fly. Something I used to do when I was teaching in person and I taught all the sessions and worked with students for 14 days in an intensive or in, in a half year on weekends is this idea of a fire and compost list. Now, most of us are digitally based, but you can grab a book or a binder and open it up to two pages on the top of one, put fire on the top of the other, put compost. Now, the majority of you, because I'm assuming you're in the pro course, want to integrate this into your work in some way, shape, or form. Um, if you're looking to create a business out of this, what I can say is uh, you may be better suited or your gifts or your essence of who you are may be better suited to a specific demographic, a specific way of designing. It could be a specific element of design. So one of my colleagues and friends were actually developing a course right now is one of the best water designers I've ever seen when it comes to gray water, composting toilets, and rainwater. Um, and that's what he does exclusively, even though he has a beautiful site, grows close to 95% of his own food. He just loves water systems. So he's specialized in that. So what I will say is that after every week or even after every block of information, really take note of the tools, the techniques, the major concepts, and those elements that fire you up, get you excited, put on the fire list. Start to make a running total of all the things that really excite you about permaculture. What are the different areas, the, the little pieces? And then on the other side, the things that don't, put in the compost list, the idea that we can compost our scars and limitations and they come back as fertile soil for something else in the future. The interesting thing about this exercise that I've given to students now for the last 13 years is that at the end of the course, it gives you a short list to come back to. And then I ask three questions of every element on that list. So be it composting toilets or be it agroforestry or be it targeted grazing with goats. You know, that's sort of the length and breadth you can get into permaculture is, do I think I enjoy this? Is this something I really enjoy? It's a question I ask for each of these elements. The second is, am I more for this? So after researching it or working on it, do I feel enlivened by it or do I feel frustrated by it? And while I've worked with large grazing animals, large grazing animals really just don't fire me up. I'm not excited to go out and move them around or move fences. It's just not something that within my world, I put a lot of stock in. Yeah, I, I, we have animals and we work with them, but it's not something that really fires me up. And we don't have to be everything to everyone, contrary to popular belief. And then that last question. So first, do I enjoy this? Am I more for this? You know, uh, is it regenerative? That last one is, um, do I have any skill in this? And you may not, but those three questions give you an even shorter list with the short list being three yeses of what you may want to pursue next and in what way you may want to pursue them. So that's that fire and compost list. I'm just going to check down and see if Karen's given me a, an update. Yeah, I was able to join. Oh, perfect. Good to see you. Awesome. Yeah, I was trying to use the app because I, I use it for business all the time, but it forced me to join through the browser. So okay, figured it out. Great to have you. Um, okay, so I'm going to get into a bit of the design process, um, my design process, but I think I'll give you just a little quick intro to myself. So um, again, my name is Javin Kurt Bernakovich. I own and operate allpointsdesign.ca. That's All Points Design. Um, which is a land and life design company. So I basically help people who are stalled, stuck, or stagnated in understanding land, finding land, working with land, create abundant, diverse, and if necessary, profitable landscapes that get better year after year. And I've worked on everything from balconies to 6,500 acres, be they farm, development, homestead, co-housing. Uh, I was currently approached by the province of British Columbia to amend their ALR, Agricultural Land Reserve, to include farm hamlets. So these ideas that we could have agrihoods, but at a hamlet scale underneath this specific land designation within British Columbia. Um, I live in Canada, so I'm a, a British Columbian. Currently, I was born in Alberta. Um, 
I, my background was, I was, I was raised in a city. I was, I was raised on canned food and lots of television and going to malls and always kind of felt like there was something wrong with the way that we were living. Didn't really make sense to me that for the majority of our genetic stability as a species, we were nomadic, we were involved. And then all of a sudden, 14,000 years ago, we decided agriculture is the best way to get our food. And when you look at that at face value uh, from a modern perspective, you're like, yeah, that makes sense. But when you look at it from, would you rather have a confined animal feedlot cow or would you rather have um, game animal that was raised by itself that was in a natural ecosystem? You know, if we remove taste from the equation because everyone has been raised on a very bland palate these days, most people would choose that animal that had been raised by itself through natural influences. So over the years, as I worked in construction and marketing and advertising, and then back to environmental education, working with Alberta Parks, and then with a private enterprise, I just realized that I really wanted to have a bigger difference. I found myself out on uh, Vancouver Island. I took a permaculture design course at One United Resource Eco Village and realized that permaculture, especially the prime directive, the three ethics and the design imperatives as outlined by Bill Mollison and David Holmgren, gave me a playground that I thought I could never get bored in. Um, and at that point, I jumped in head, hands and feet, as my Cuban permaculture compatriots would say. And I had a, a wonderful start in my career. Uh, I basically spent a lot of time uh, working with mentors and um, contracting them to help teach me further. Then I got in invitations to start teaching I started operating multi-person courses, which at that point was not very common, brought in specialists, created Permaculture BC as a premier way of being bioregional specialists in. And that was a nice little hack. It was kind of my bachelor's in permaculture. I brought in um, really experienced people. They put on courses and part of our exchange was I got to spend a day with them and learn from them. And I was in the course as well. From there, I started getting invitations to teach down in Cuba with my colleague, Ron Berzan, the urban farmer. So we did a 21 day roving permaculture design course, which was super fun. We started in Veredero and then we went down to Sancto Spiritus and then out to Santiago de Cuba. Um, we had a 10 day design and install at the end of the course, which was super fun. So we spent about 12 days bombing around and then nine, 10 days actually designing and installing with Cubans. Um, had an opportunity to take students over to Kenya and Uganda and did some phenomenal work there. We, we developed and created the Practical Permaculture Institute, Institute of Kenya, which is on my website under the portfolio, which then led to all the Practical Permaculture Institutes in East Africa and uh, grew quite uh, exponentially. Uh, after that, I started to learn a little bit from Sepp Holzer and... Um, from Jeff Lawton and uh, Darren Darty, and Rosemary Morrow and Lane Ingham, you know, the list is long. Uh, this is one of the things about this industry is that you've got a lot of touch points and people to, to work with. And then in about eight, nine years ago, I realized that um, we really didn't have a good decision-making matrix within permaculture, but holistic management had a great uh, holistic decision framework. So I started educating myself in that and as much as I love Alan Savory, his writing can be a little tough to get through. So I started to revamp a lot of the holistic decision-making, which ended up becoming values-based decision-making, which I've now specialized in for about seven years, which is understanding what do you want this project or relationship, or it doesn't matter, it's not even land anymore. What do you want it to feel like, look like, be like? What do you want the qualities to be in the future? And then using that as your touchstone, your your values that then are used to filter out all of the, well, should I have chickens or should I have a peach tree or should I have a kolometka kiwi? All of these specific decisions can be run through that matrix and through a number of testing questions and come up with um, an understanding of will this element, will this design decision bring about this major quality of life? And so one of the things I offer for clients, uh, especially broad scale clients and homestead clients is um, this process values-based decision-making. I'm also running a, a fall or a winter course, a group cohort uh, into this process. And if I could have gone back and started my, my work uh, again, I would have done values-based decision-making first because it just makes everything really easy. And then over the last little while, I had the opportunity to come into my own piece of land and stewarding it and building up soil and building up systems. And so now I work with 
um, clients on a yearly basis. Uh, my design process is a lot longer than others. I, I, I tend to take anywhere from six to 12 months to design a site. I just like seeing the site multiple times, being there multiple times, talking with the clients, becoming friends with them. I also don't work with people I don't like anymore. <laughs> you, you can get to a place in your work that you eventually get there. Thanks for the thumbs up. Um, it, was, uh, it was a good decision. I'll have to say that. And uh, we could go into more of that later. But um, I do a lot of life design work now because I applied a lot of the ecological principles that I had learned into life design, which include values-based decision-making, um, and, and a lot of business design. It's amazing how much, once you understand the ecological processes, they transfer completely because shock of shockers, we are ecology. Uh, we just like to think that we're um, apart from nature instead of a part of nature. And so that's what takes up a lot of my time. I recently created uh, Regenerative Living, regenerativeliving.com uh, or .org, which is a online educational platform aimed at teaching skills to live on the planet as if we intend to stay. Over COVID, I saw a lot of um, polarization and recalcitrant behavior in people within my circles. And I just wanted an easy place to teach very simple skills so people could just learn something and apply it. And so we've had some great courses about family food security, how to understand how much food your family needs, how to go about getting it, and how to actually grow that food. We've got a cohort right now that's going over the summer. We've got a self-paced course. We did a great low-tech erosion control, so using logs, rocks, sticks, and very simple methods to slow erosion or stop it completely with Neil Bertrando and Jeffrey Adams. We had a great course about growing pawpaws. We've got a number of courses coming up um, all about soil, water. We've got some targeted grazing courses, one of the first targeted grazing courses I've seen. Um, so if you're interested in targeted grazing, working with goats for vegetation management, um, Jeanette Hall of Bad Plant Management is going to be uh, teaching that, and I'm so stoked. She's just a phenom. And uh, yeah, that, that makes up the majority of the day. And then I spend um, a lot of time with OSU. So developing content like the template, the tutorials, teaching. I've got two courses uh, on the go at any one time with roughly 30 to 45 students apiece. Um, and that kind of keeps up the day plus the gardens and everything else around here and keep myself sane. So that's a little intro to me. And now I'm just gonna check the chat, nothing there. I'm gonna see if there's any other questions. Nope, so let's go into the design process. So I, this is a permaculture design course. And so we're gonna teach the permaculture design course method. I am not a permaculture only designer. I'm a regenerative land designer that has a big toolbox. And so you may find that some of what I tell you is about being a craftsperson within this um, world and then using elements of permaculture. Larry Santoyo, uh, instructor out of LA who used to be a cop, likes to say, you don't do permaculture, you use permaculture in what you do. And I, I really think that's true. So my approach may not be, um, it isn't what the course has laid out, but you're, you're welcome to adopt or ask questions about what I do. So basically, once we have a design and it's confirmed, the first thing I do is I look for data. So I'm trying to see, is there any topographical data that exists that I can use? The reason for this is that data can help to inform the design. The map is never the territory, but I think it's an important piece to start with. And I can make a lot of pre-assessments uh, and in some situations, full design criteria off of that information. So I tend to look for high resolution topographical information. Um, Google Earth is not high resolution topographical data. And I, I, I'm the spokesperson for this message because um, in 2000, NASA flew what's called the Shuttle, Shuttle Radar Topographic Mission, the SRTM, went around the planet, shot LIDAR, uh, light image detection and radar, shot a laser down at the planet, bounced back. They gave them a sense of generally what the planet looked like. Now, each pixel of that image that they produced was 30 meters aside. This meant that if you had any elevational difference that was less than 30 meters, the, the computer programs did that amazing scientific work of guessing or interpolating and created what they thought was generally the map of the planet. Uh, what we found is that the x-axis, which is the vertical axis, or pardon me, the z-axis, which is the vertical axis, can be in error up to 15 meters, and the x and y can be in error up to 5 meters. So 
while the information from Google Earth can be useful, especially at scale, um, it can be problematic for making very specific um, design criteria. What does that mean? That means that you can take information that uses that data set, like contour map generator, almost all the contour map generators are using that data set because there is no better data set. Sometimes locally there is, somebody's flown LIDAR on a, on a specific area of a specific country. But generally, if that's all you have, great, use that. And just make note of it saying, I understand the error and everything will be ground truth. So this is true even of the high scale designs or the topographic information that I find. Um, I still ground truth, which means, yeah, I may either make a survey or get one purchased that's like eight or 10 centimeter accuracy, but I still go, I still create um, contours or off contour lines. And we always ground truth on the land before we implement, always, always, always. So really when we're talking about contours, when we're talking about data, um, topographical information, find the best you can, make note of it, know the assumptions that come with that and just make sure those are clear. If I don't have that information, I will either purchase it or I will uh, survey a site. And there's lots of different ways to survey. Right now, I've got a hybrid model, which is if it is open canopy, I will uh, fly a drone. And I, I've used in the past a DJI 4 um, and I've used a Mavic 1 and a Mavic 2. Uh, I do not know if the other drone companies work. You'll find that the third party uh, processing applications, the programs, the apps will tell you what, what drones work with which apps. Um, the two apps that are used are Maps Made Easy, which is cheaper, but a little less reliable, not as many functions, and Drone Deploy, which is very expensive, but pays uh, for the expense in the output of what they create. And basically from that and using what's called photogrammetry, it basically knows where the drone is in the sky, knows where it took off and can interpolate what and how the ground changes. And that can get you eight centimeter accuracy for what's called a digital elevation model, which you can then extrapolate different, um, different maps from. Um, I've also used uh, what's called a real-time kinetic ground station with a rover, which basically means you set up this um, base station, you let it uh, you let it find its location on the planet for as long as you can because it becomes more and more and more accurate. And then you take a roving stick and you basically take points within the landscape. And sometimes I marry these two together if we've got big open spaces and small spaces. If you go onto my website under the portfolio region and um, the Curtis Stone Survey Homestead, you'll find that that was the process I used there as I combined the two. From there, I have exports. So I have exports that are in what's called a KMZ uh, extension, which allows me to import those into Google Earth Pro. And I use Google Earth Pro pretty prolifically. The reason is uh, it's easy to use and my clients can use it. So anything I create in Google Earth Pro, I can send to them and with either a very simple tutorial or with uh, a little conversation, they can access that information. So I've moved kind of to a digital delivery for my clients because a lot of them are savvy. A lot of them are working with these processes anyways. And one of the things I love about Google Earth Pro is that with two different programs on, on mobile, uh, mobile operating systems, one is GPS Kit for Apple, which is, I think, still 13 bucks. And the other is Gaia GPS for Android. You can take photos in situ and you can import those photos into Google Earth. And so you can have a site visit set that you can come back to and take the same photo in the same place over and over and over again. So I really like that because it, it helps them. There's other mapping programs. There's uh, QGIS, ArcGIS are two of the majors. QGIS being free, ArcGIS being paid. Um, and they're great, they're beautiful, they're wonderful. But again, for my needs to translate information to my clients and make very simple drawings, that's all I need to do. Um, after that, once I get the information, the outputs and all the rest of it, I'll usually bring things into an iPad application called Morfolio Trace, which is a yearly subscription for like, I think 23, 24 bucks. Uh, but what I love about it is it is a geo-referenced program. So I can either take information directly from Google Earth, or I can bring in a photo that has a scale 
and I can scale the entire drawing, which means I'm constantly drawing in scale. And you'll find that to be very useful if you decide to do this full time, drawing in scale, especially when working with plant, plant sizes, um, maintenance access, you name it, you're going to want to draw in scale in some way, shape or form. And uh, there was a time when the applications on the iPad didn't do this. And I literally had to make a ruler in the digital space and move it around and all the rest of it, but things have caught up. Um, I'm playing with an app called Concepts and I like it because it's vector based, which means vector just means instead of drawing a line, you're drawing a wire and you move the wire around. It also means you can't fill in wires with color because they're just wires and uh, really have started to like Concepts. It, it doesn't have that same sort of geo reference, but it's, it's okay. Um, I've also played around with a number of other applications. I've, I've played around, excuse me, with SketchUp and Adobe Illustrator and Infinity. I just recently created an entire list of digital assets, which uh, I've been told by Andrew is in module one under a digital assets um, label. I haven't checked it out or checked out where it is yet. But um, what's great about that list is you kind of see what the, the smorgasbord is, the cornucopia of riches we have to work with. Again, do not learn a rendering software on top of this course. It's just not worth it. Focus on the course. You'll be really happy you did. And then as I go throughout this, I use a lot, I use a, a template that follows the a key line scale of permanence for all things agricultural that was amended by Darren Darty and the Regrarians platform. And basically that's how I put all my information to different areas. So I put information into climate and topography and water and access and structure. All of those things become little boxes that I can put in information that comes into it. And I subdivide those boxes into existing and proposed. So if it's existing information, it goes into the existing box. If it's proposed, it goes into the proposed box. So designs, concept designs go into proposed. Existing is if I'm doing a vegetative essay or a water essay, or I find the well report, or the clients have information or the neighbors have information about the site. That all goes into those different buckets. So that way I can focus and, and work in there. Uh, you'll find that how I design on each overlay I've, I've imbued the template and specifically the tutorials with that. So if you go through the tutorials, you get a real sense of how I go in and design by rooms and that'll all make sense when you go through the tutorial. But that's generally my process and generally how I work at this. And I'm just gonna move up here. Okay, so I don't know who's, who's Chinchilla, but whoever that is, um, feel free to put that under June 27th if you've got a question here and put your name just like uh, Karen did uh, or under Noah, so that's great. No, for the land acknowledgement, how do the five questions in the assignment correlate to the three questions on the template? Answer the five in the three. Exactly. So um, they're not totally unified because sometimes um, generally the, the, the teaching team of the course tend to focus on the template and sometimes uh, there's a bit of a backlog on the assignments. But basically the, the land acknowledgement is getting at the idea that there were individuals on this land before modernity that stewarded it in a way that had uh, that had a sense of the perpetuation of that land. And so my group in particular has Europeans, has folks from Asia, has folks from Africa. And so some of those people are the descendants of the original people. And so we're not necessarily saying it has to be um, a, a profuse acknowledgement, but an acknowledgement that there were individuals that managed that landscape in an elongated manner. And the way that they did that had value. And a couple of years ago, I had the opportunity, I, I got some funding to do a documentary. Um, we did it about fire. It's called Facing Fire, Building Resiliency to Wildfire. You can find it on um, YouTube. It's 22 minutes. And it's basically about how we got ourselves into our fire situation currently in North America and what we can do about it. And what was fascinating is that when colonization happened, um, they, the, the individuals that came over generally brought a Germanic forest management system. And when they did that, they brought in almost all of the nascent or concept issues that we're dealing with today. And there was a Congress that was held in the early 1900s where forestry experts came together and said, listen, the way we're managing the forest is, is destroying them and is creating wildfires, which actually precipitated the um, US Fire Service and the, the parallel in Canada. 
um, do you think we should go back? Do you think we should would should connect with the First Nations here, or, or one of the First Nations, um, and we should start to adopt some of their their forestry practices, including anthropological burning, low and slow burning. And it was unilaterally said no because they came with the preconceived notion that anybody who didn't have their sense of civilization and modernity couldn't have anything valuable to teach them. And the land acknowledgement is acutely trying to address what is nascent in all of us, to be honest, that we all have some sort of dismissiveness out of a quote unquote primitive lifestyle. And some of those, again, quote unquote primitive lifestyles were some of the most sophisticated ways of managing land. And the stories I think in Facing Fire are a great way to show showcase that. And I think a lot of the fish uh, fishing management systems of the Coast Salish, the Salish and the Haida Gwaii people in British Columbia are, are excellent. And generally, wherever I start to investigate and learn about indigenous people, there is always something to learn. You'll find in the building survey, we asked specifically about what were the materials and what were the ways of building that um, indigenous or first nations used. And what's the value of that? And almost everybody goes, well, I don't have birch bark anymore, so I can't use that. It's like, how about we take the idea that there was materials on site that we used and we used them for the durability that they had. And if we just took that concept, we could avoid a lot of the issues we deal with today. I think Adobe and Cobb are two great examples. A colleague of mine, Gord Baird, eco-sense.ca created a two-story Cobb load-bearing building that could survive earthquakes, first one in North America. And that building, the majority of that building will decompose if it ever falls down. But if you look the world over, uh, two thirds of the world still lives in quote unquote mud huts, adobe huts, compressed bricks huts, monolithics with like cob. And what's fascinating is that that lesson can permeate through all of permaculture because permaculture isn't just the plants and the, the water. It's, it's a really a different way of looking at the problem. So uh, Noah, hopefully I've answered that question. Do you want to give me the thumbs up or just quickly unmute and let me know if you, if that works for you? Oh, thumbs up. I see it. Awesome. Cool. Stupendous. Wilson. Oh, nice. Lots of questions. Um, I was hoping to get some clarification on what I see in the lesson one assignment. I'm getting confused between what I see in the module and the PDC report on Google Docs. So in the module under lesson one assignments, I see the personal survey. There's also a section in the PDC report asking the same question. So I answered them there. Uh, then in the design site, I see the design site tab with indigenous land acknowledgement. The PDF is asking different questions and there's no land acknowledgement. So do we have to add a page in the document? Yeah. So um, again, the, the, the module ask and the template are not always unified. Default to the template. So just default to the template and I will bring this up with the powers that be that that work with this. The template, the template basically has everything you'll need to ask. So the questions are already listed there and anything left over in the module is just that it's left over and they haven't gotten to um, replacing it. So thanks for the question, I appreciate it. Romain, you talk about the importance of considering native plants in our design. Are there good databases for plants for North America? Yeah, so generally, um, the natural capital plant database, which we first see in assignment 19 or 17, I think. Yeah. So on the left-hand side of assignment 17, we have what's called the natural capital plant database um, is a great database to start looking at plants and their interactions. The other one is plants for a future, which is all listed in the assignments in the module work in the assignments as you go throughout it. But the other thing is starting to become really excited about looking at and finding books of your local region. So I started in the Rockies. So I, I have this book still, this is Lone Pine. Also the acorn guides are great in North America. And then you can, you can tell when, when permaculture hit because I was a natural interpreter for a while there. Um, so these books, finding a good um, native plant ID book of your area or website um, is fantastic. Um, depending on where you are, you may find these resources and you may not. So uh, it, it always depends on where you are in the world. You talked about managing erosion. I have some erosion issues on my site due to heavy rainfalls during storms. Do you have any good resources I could look into managing erosion? Yeah, so in the water um, module, 
there's a number of really good um, resources in there. But the one that I really like is the, the uh, Quivera Coalition's Erosion Control Guide. Erosion Control. Uh, I think this is it. Yeah, here. So I'm just going to put a link to this because it is freely available on their website. If you speak Spanish or if you work in Spanish, they have a great, um, they have a great uh, Spanish version. So this is the Quivera Erosion Control Guide. So if you'd like to take that, you're welcome to it. Um, and generally, as we get into the design work, um, as you start to detail out and assess your, uh, your site, we can ask more specific questions as they come up, because as they come up, I'll have a better sense of what the site is, what it looks like, what's going on with it. But um, the Covera Coalition is, is great for erosion. Um, there's beaver analogs, which are fantastic, which is a little bit more involved. Of course, we have dams like the small earth and dam conversation and generally vegetative cover. So one of the things that's phenomenal about uh, key line design, and again, key line design, for some of you who made, might have heard it, isn't just the plowing of, of the key line plow. It's a full design process. It's a full farm design process. And a lot of people forget about that. Um, one of the major things that PIE Omens did was uh, to revegetate almost every single drainage and to occlude it from uh, animals. Very smart. Uh, really to honor those those drainages and to work with them. And so what you'll find is that if you do have erosion happening, the work within the Quivera Coalition's um, document there, and I'll just pull it up uh, so we can kind of just take a look at it together and I'll switch my screen. Um, what's amazing about this, it's about slowing, spreading and sinking water. And you'll, you'll hear this as a, a permaculture mantra as we get into um, water design over and over again. You know, this type of work is really about understanding the mechanisms of how water comes down as a sheet, or pardon me, water comes down as a raindrop. That raindrop then impacts the soil. It's a very violent process if it's, if it's unvegetated. And a soil ped, which is a soil molecule, which was made up of sand, silt, and clay, which we'll get into when we get into the soil assignment, will break apart. And usually what will happen is we'll get sheet flow. And so sheet flow will flow over in a sheet and eventually due to micro topographic indentations, it will start to collect and create rills, runnels, rivlets, and then it'll get into a gully form. And that gully form, that high steep transportive area will then create erosion. And what'll happen is eventually you'll get a drop there and that drop will literally unzip a landscape. It'll start at the bottom and it'll unzip that landscape because that that drop, that pooling, will then slowly roll a road and go all the way up that landscape. And recently I just did um, a really great interview with a colleague of mine. We're looking at putting together a course, uh, Natalie Topia, Natalie Topa, sorry, uh, who works in uh, who works in Africa exclusively. And this is an amazing video. I highly recommend folks check out just, if not for her tenacity for the work that she's done, she, along with um, Daniel Lawton, Jeff Lawton's son, went to Burundi and ended up working on, uh, I'll put this both in the chat and I'll put this in the, the notes. So I'll put it up in the resources. Uh, so I'll put this in here from flood to food. Um, basically, starting at the top of the watershed, they walked down and they made sure to create a prison for water. So wherever that water was, they put it into action. They put it into function. Um, they put it into gardens. They took it out of the road. You'll find, especially in places that use uh, dirt path or dirt roadways, this is usually where we get erosion first. Um, you see it on our roads all the time. Um, it's one of the reasons why whenever I build dirt pathways, I crown them quite high to the point to where they're almost unusable by a wheelbarrow, which is the standard mode of transportation for most of these sites. Um, still usable, but basically over time, what'll happen is that'll compress out. And it's basically just crowning the pathway like we do with our roads. Um, but that is a great resource to look through to get ideas. And um, she's fun. She's uh, She's got a no-nonsense attitude. She's one of my faves. And we're looking at putting a course together. So yeah, that'll be fun. 
Okay, looks like we got that question, that one, that one. Looks like Aaron's just quickly putting in a question. So just wait for that. Um, any follow-up questions to anything I've, I've asked? Either you can unmute or if anybody has just a follow-up. It's a lot of information all at once. This is why we record these things. And I'm, I'm curious, I'm curious from like a, cause you had mentioned, um, you had said something along the lines of, uh, well, I know it was in reference to plant recommendations. So as far as permaculture goes in the, the plants that are recommended, it's not necessarily natives, right? That's where no. you're going with it? No, okay. it's not. No. So uh, permaculture takes a viewpoint that, um, and it's a long viewpoint. And this is where if you get into education and you start getting invites, one of the, one of the tenants uh, that I was, I was taught when I started in this work is go where you're invited. And that really helped because you'll find that um, bursting into a room or somebody's livelihood and telling them that they're doing it wrong is not a great way to make friends. Um, so please, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to layer that in beginning. Do not go to a farmer and tell them they don't know what they're doing. For some reason, this has been one of those things that has happened in Burma and it's super annoying um, and cringy. Um, but what we found over time is that plants have for millennia moved. They've, they've gone from place to place as, as different climates have shifted and as ice ages have come and receded and as, as polar shifts have happened. Um, there is always, we're always in transition. We're always moving to another element. We're always moving to a, a different climatic zone. Um, at the end of day two, we usually had this invasives talk around a campfire talking about how people spread seeds um, pre-stationary agriculture. And what is fascinating is that when you talk about invasives or you talk about weeds, you have to dictate dictate a time scale a scale because at some point there was date palms in british columbia due to a specific warmer we know it because of the fossil record so we have natives as a as a as a palette and we have non-natives as a palette i would defer to natives in almost every situation however there's really only i think there's six six or five i always forget the number but there's six or five common food plants that we you know, actively eat, or some of us actively eat, elderberries, you know, is not very um, adopted by North America. Um, so we have a, a much larger diversity of plants. And if you were honest, butter lettuce isn't an invasive. Tomatoes are invasive, right? If, if we go by the letter of the law, they do displace different plants within that area. So we have to take all this with a grain of salt and go we're going to work with the natives we have, especially if we're rehabilitating landscape. So a colleague of mine, David Polster, uh, who unfortunately is retired due to a medical issue, was probably one of the best soil bioengineers because he worked with something called live staking. So he would take pioneer plants that could be taken from live cutting and be placed into the ground with live staking and would grow things like willow, alder, red or dogwood. And he would completely armor different waterways because when you have a waterway, you have what's called the cut bank and you have the depositional zone. So whenever you get a bend in a river, you get this little cut bank and it erodes and erodes and erodes and erodes and erodes. Well, sometimes that's a facility area. Sometimes that's a farm. Sometimes that's the steep embankment that goes from the University of British Columbia down to what's called Wreck Breach. And what he found, because he was uh, contracted by the Department of Transportation, is after the Trans-Canada Highway, the major highway that goes through Canada, their revegetation attempts failed because they had clear-cut, ostensibly, everything beside the highway. And then they were going in trying to create a climax ecology by throwing on wildflowers and planting conifers. And the conifers were the same size as when planted 10, sometimes 15 years later because the ecology wasn't built up to support that next step in the succession. 
And so what he did, what he proved is if you go along and you live stake this material that you can find anywhere, you go into the riparian areas, you plant it during a time of rain and you plant it down into these holes. So you take a piece of rebar that's about the same size or a little bit bigger than your, your cuttings and you put it down half a meter, a foot and a half, two feet, and then put the, the live cutting in there that you've taken off as branches. Again, making sure that the buds are up, it's still a plant, still needs to be in the right direction. Um, they would completely and utterly regrow. And in the same amount of time would introduce birds, would entice birds, would entice animals, would bring in conifer seeds, would self sow conifer seeds because the ecology was supporting it. And those conifers in areas where the previous conifers were would outgrow the conifers that were planted in the first place because the ecology was supportive. So it's a bigger conversation than just using natives or non-natives. It's a conversation about where are we in the successional cycle of this landscape? What is still there that's in what's called the native blueprint? And we get into this in the local ecology survey. It's something I do whenever I design or when I'm teaching design. So a, a number of students after the course will contract me for hours to mentor them. And there was a student from uh, the north side of North America and they sent me all of their initial designs and nowhere did it have what was the climax ecology. So I did some sleuthing. I found the climax ecology, found the entire plant list, found the fauna list. I was like, so let's talk about what's supposed to be here, what's native here, what this wants to be, and let's see what's missing. And let's ask a really important question. Why is it missing? And in that, we actually found that there were some issues with the soil because we weren't seeing the earthworm and the nematode populations we want we needed to see, which led us to believe that there was a dewormer. And sure enough, they had been using horse manure that hadn't been aged properly and the dewormers, which are pervasive in horse culture, um, were still persistent. So when, when we're working with natives or non-natives, we default to natives. Uh, we default to that existing blueprint, that, that biological blueprint. And then we ask ourselves, well, what could we add in here that would meet the needs of these three Venn diagrams? So there's three Venn diagrams. Diagram number one is what is the inherent characteristics of this landscape? What does it want to be? What is it moving towards? Is it a riparian area? Is it at the toe of the slope? Is it on the slope? Is it a ridge? Um, is it a temperate forest? Is it a coastal forest? Is it a desert? Is it a prairie? And again, everything has its own climax. So a climax prairie and a climax forest, they're the same in terms of ecological value because that's what that native area wants to climax into. Then from there, we have another circle that overlaps. This is what is the client's needs, wants, desires, and what are they bringing to the table? So money, experience, time, what's that look like? And then finally, we have a third circle. And this third circle um, was not taught in permaculture until about 15 years ago. And that's what is the regulations? So as designers, there is a burden of design. There's, there's a story about a permaculture designer in Canada who came in and was prolific in, in telling people where to put their ponds, they'd put them in. And the, uh, the local uh, enforcement for regulation would come in and make a cease and desist and have them fill it back in because they just weren't working with the Water Sustainability Act in that area. Does that mean that we shouldn't have civil courage when there are things that are adhering to natural law instead of uh, human law? No, but it means we should be informed. It means if we're going to bend or break the rules, we should be informed about what we're doing and we should convey the risk of that to clients. Um, or we should decide that we're going to stay on this side of the law and we're just going to do the best work we can because changing laws can be its entirely own work in and of itself or challenging that law. Um, and you only have to take a look at the raw milk um, issue in Canada and um, the farmer there who got himself into hot water to understand, or uh, the farmer that got himself into hot water with uh, Monsanto and GMO seeds. So um, the overlap of those three, what does the land wanna be? What are the clients bringing to the table? Wants, desires, et cetera, and regulations. And in the middle is the sweet spot. That's the sweet spot that we get to work in. That's what we're trying to find. And sometimes the permaculture design we do doesn't look like going up to the permaculture grocery shelf and putting an arm in and bringing everything into the cart. Oh, I've got a dam and I've got compost and I've got chickens and I've got, and I don't like herb spirals. So this is me 
telling you my prejudice. <laughs> I think they're hard to water. I don't think it makes sense to do them. I've never seen them work really well. Feel free to try them. We can all share our experiences. But let's not take a bunch of pre-existing patterns within permaculture and just stamp a landscape willy-nilly. Let's take the time to really think about it. And sometimes it's like jujitsu or Aikido, where it's just a little bit of motion, a little bit of push in one direction, and the whole thing happens. I, I visited a site in Austria, a Sepulcher site, his second site, the Holzerhof, um, where all he did was create a bench terraced around nut trees and realized that if he left it long enough, it would, it would create a nut nursery. That the, the nuts that were falling from the nut tree would fall on this flat plateau that was back graded. Most terraces are not flat, they're back graded, so that way they hold a bit of water and would produce all the nuts he needed for any project he was working on. And he was right. It was just a simple, specific design that worked within that context. So arguably we default to natives, um, but we look at what's possible on site, what's the desires from the clients, what's the regulations, and what's that sweet spot of, yeah, you know, a couple of nut trees here makes sense. Knowing that some nut trees produce drug loans and can be completely allopathic to pretty much every other plant besides ribes and savory herbs. So like all of those things we need to start to become aware of and we learn them slowly. So this is what I wasn't taught. It was like when I had my PDC, I thought I needed to know everything out of the gate and it really, really retarded my growth. I was I was under delusions of grandeur right from the beginning and had to restart a couple of times. So my mistake hopefully can be your learning because we all learn from mistakes. They don't have to be our own is to take it slow to start to learn. And if you are like me and have a really hard time remembering plants and identifying plants, start to make your own template, start to make your own database of plants and start to get to know one plant and work with one plant a year. This was advice that was given to me by my mentor and now very close friend, Brandon Bauer of IntelliKey Nurseries. Um, I started to work with a plant that I liked. So I started to work with uh, C. buckthorn in year one and Hippophagia rhamnoides and loved it and worked with it and learned about it, learned how to propagate it, learned how to, 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 to do all the things I wanted to do with it. And then the next year I learned about tomatoes. And the year after that, I learned about garlic. And as I was picking up steam, as I was having successes, I became more excited. But before that, I ended up just being like, well, I have to learn all these plants and I need to understand them and I need to have this big template and this big palette. You know, if you've got a couple of dozens that you know work, that's great. A lot of people in permaculture suffer from the terrible affliction of out of zone -itis. That's thinking that you can grow everything <laughs> everywhere. You can, but it takes a lot of work. I know guys that grow avocados and peaches in Alberta. And it's like, yeah, how much time does that take? As opposed to growing berries that want to grow on the prairies. So yeah, you can do something, but should we do something is a better question. Is this what we should be putting our efforts into? And I really, 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 really default to the hits. What are the things you know are going to grow? What are the things that you know are easy? One of the uh, design approaches I take with new clients that are wanting to grow all their own, own food is I get them to go to the nursery. I get them to buy four little four inch mint plants. I get them to put them into one, two or five gallon pots, fill them with soil. And I get them to put those pots in the ground because mint spreads like a hot dam. And if you're not ready for it, it'll outcompete everything else. And then two or three times over the year, I get them to, to cut and dry and cut and dry. And the very first year, they have their own mint, low bar, low bar. They came sailing over it and they're super excited. They're like, what's next? And then next year, they're almost always the same. They take on 10 things, nine of them fail and they feel terrible. So then they come back, they're like, well, the mint thing worked. What's the next thing? I'm like, well, what do you like to eat? Well, we love tomatoes. Okay, great. This is the year of tomatoes. Reach out to your neighbors. You get to grow two varieties, not three, not four, two. Go figure out how to grow two varieties. And once you know how to grow those, then yeah, experiment. But you need to know the how first before you get into the experimentation. And once you get into the experimentation, you can do what's called the shotgun approach, which is, okay, yeah, I know garlic grows here. I know how to grow garlic. Now I'm gonna grow three soft necks, four hard necks. I'm gonna see if I can find something that's outside of what everybody else is growing. So I could have an edge if I'm, if I'm going to market, 
right? In my neck of the woods, everybody grows red Russian hard nut. Everybody has it. There's, there's no uniqueness in that. So if you're looking at creating profitability, which is something I've, I've, I specialized in within this work, you really have to be able to, to, to play on the edges, right? So you can have that little extra or work with value add, which is kind of getting away from the, the question. But does that answer the question in a very long-winded way? <laughs> yeah, no, that was great. I like long-winded. <laughs> awesome. So we are over. So I'm just going to take the last question. Um, Romaine, it's very hard to contain the excitement of trying to learn all these new things right now. Yeah. <laughs> I call it shiny thing thingonitis. Permaculturalists are especially uh, susceptible to say, oh my God, that's so exciting. I want to learn that. Um, so I'll pass on one more thing before I get to uh, Wilson's final question here. Um, uh, there's two words for time in Greek language. One is chronos, which most of us know, which is the progression of time, linear time moving forward. And the other is kairos. Now, kairos is really important because kairos is the immediacy of an issue within the chronos of time. And it was about four years in after I was taking like, I don't know, three to seven courses a year. I was like, I'm done. I'm not taking a course unless there's a Kairos, unless there's an immediate issue, unless I have a project or whatever it could be. And what was amazing about that is I then was able to focus on the work I was doing. And then if I needed to learn something, I would either go to a mentor and contract time from them or go and get a course. And now with self-paced course, it's amazing. You can like, we just did a hedgerow course and we're finding that when people are designing a hedgerow, they're just going and buying the course. It's perfect. So one of the things I learned was just to work on the information you needed at the time. Wilson, in lesson one module at the top, right, is the due date highlighted in the blue bar. I noticed that change from what it said originally, which was July 18th, to now being July 4th. Did something change or was this a glitch? So what happened was the instruct or the, the team that put together the, the course, they ended up not putting in the correct due dates. And so they just changed our correct. So that first uh, due date is July. Uh, I'm just going to bring this up here. Is July 4th. Yeah. Instead of July 18th. And then all the other dates have been augmented to be accurate to uh, what we're seeing. Good question. All right, folks. Any uh, any final comments, queries, quotations? Uh, no, just thanks for asking that question. I that's two extra weeks we don't early, so it's good to know. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think they sent out a notification about it, but if they haven't, I'll definitely pass that along as well. All right, folks. Well, super pleasure to be with you for the next uh, 20 weeks plus break. Um, really enjoy and play with the assignment, ask lots of questions. It's a real fun time to be learning this. Uh, it seems like every year, individuals such as yourself are needed more on the global and the local scale. So I'm, I'm very excited to have you as colleagues by the end of this course in some way, shape or form. And this video and all videos that we do will be up within 48 hours and they will be in that previous office hours um, link that you can find on Canvas as well. And with that, I wish you a very good day. I'm looking forward to seeing your personal surveys. You can feel free to submit them early if you like and get early feedback and ask any questions you need. Oh, I, I'll have one more. Oh, go ahead, Aaron. Okay, uh, Aaron, I, I don't know if she raised her hand. I think that's the clap. Oh, it's a clap. Okay. Uh, just, sorry, just on that, um, all three assignments are due on July 4th then, or just the personal survey? That's right. All three assignments. So when you yeah, go yeah, to that assignment, yeah, that. yeah, I'll just go right. ahead quickly and just showcase this. So when you go to the assignment, what you'll find is that there's tabs, personal design and climate. And so each tab there is required for that week. And the way it is in the template that can help um, support that is at the top here within the table of context, instead of saying week, it says lesson. So you could swap out week for lesson. And so this is week one, these three are due, week two, these two are due. And please do finish all assignments before you submit. It doesn't do me any good to have you only submit one assignment. Um, I sit down and I mark them all and I will, I will 
reply, you need to um, you need to submit them all, and make sure to to really take a look at your sharing settings. And there's a tutorial on that within the slide itself to make sure that you share it correctly, because a lot of folks will submit and I won't have access to it, and I'll just say access or link link access sharing permissions, and we have to wait a bit. So, yep, that's uh, that's the way. Thanks. Great question, Noah. All right, folks, onwards and upwards. We'll try to keep this more to an hour, but it's the first one, so sometimes it goes a bit long. And uh, we'll see you in the next one. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Have a good day. Yeah, welcome. Thank you. Ah, you're so welcome. Thanks for the thanks, folks. Oh, that's sweet. Oh, okay. yeah, and, and the tutorials. I, I mentioned it before, but I think I'm have like i like taking two courses right now, the permaculture and then <laughs> how to work all like the Google Earth and everything else. It's fantastic. <laughs> I really, really appreciate them. They're fantastic. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah, thanks for that. I appreciate it. Lots of work, but I'm glad they're helpful. Oh, yeah, so helpful. Yeah. Have a wonderful <laughs> day. Nice to meet you all. See you next time. Nice to meet everybody. Take care.